Welcome. Our next speaker is Alberto Fernandez Carvajal, and his presentation is entitled, Are We on the Same Wavelength? Interethnic Homosexual Relations and Queering the Cinema Mainstream. And yet, Iqbal's Rashid's Touch of Pink. OK, thank you very much. So my paper today examines Touch of Pink, which is a British-Canadian co-production. It's the first feature film of Ian Iqbal Rashid, who's a poet and filmmaker born in Tanzania in 1964 to Ismaili parents of Salvation Heritage. His family left Tanzania in 1970, so he actually never grew up in the place. They unsuccessfully sought asylum in Britain, but finally settled in Canada. Rashid grew up in Toronto um, and has lived in Britain since the 1990s. Uh, Farhad Daftari observes that the previous spiritual leader of Ismaili, the third Aga Khan, encouraged loyalty to the countries where Ismailis have settled. As Rashid himself has remarked in an interview, we do work well in the West, is the first quotation. Um, we do kind of assimilate better than a lot of other South Asian and Muslim communities who have migrated, and yet we are very community-minded. Family is so important, and the community is so insular as well. End of quote. In a, quite an early essay on 1970s East African Ismailis, Peter B. Clark um, also suggests that, and I quote, there is a givenness of our community in Ismailism. It stems from being born into this particular religious community. And he adds that East African Ismailis tend to form together a group. And loyalty to and kinship among East African Ismailis accounts for some of the strength of the associational and communal bonds. End of quote. So this distinctive combination of integration, modernity, and communitarian tradition entails an often fraught relationship with issues of sexual diversity that are shared with other Muslims in the diaspora, but also elsewhere. And uh, Karim H. Karim, uh, a scholar of Islam, Isma, uh, Is Ismail Islam, suggests that Ismailis experience unfolds un uh, unendingly in the intervening spaces, what he calls the interstices, between tradition, modernity, and postmodernity. So what I will do in this paper today is examine touch of pink as being placed at those very interstices between the demands of Ismaili tradition, colonial and, and Western modernity, and diasporic postmodernity. The film is a romantic comedy with explicit allusions to the Hollywood of the Golden Age. The film's protagonist is Aleem, pictured here on the right, played by Jimmy Mystery, a Canadian man of Ismaili Kenyan heritage, living in London with his partner Giles, played by Chris Holden Wright, pictured left, who's a white British man. The sentimental relationship is unknown to Aleem's Ismaili family in Canada. And as we gradually find out, Aleem's childhood trauma surrounding his father's untimely death his mother's temporary relocation to London and his incipient homosexuality all drove him to the creation of, a, of an imaginary friend, the so-called spirit of Cary Grant, who's played by uh, Carl McLachlan, who you know from Twin Peaks, probably. The film's main plot involves the visit of Alim's mother, Nuru, played by Suleika Matthew, to London to convince Alim to attend his cousin's wedding back in Canada. And she also uses this as an attempt to lure him back to Canada to a heteronormative lifestyle with a potential Ismaili wife. A touch of Pink ultimately depicts the ways in which diasporic Ismaili citizens have to juggle the conflicting demands of their community's traditions and of global modernity. The downside of Alim's diasporic predicament, however, is that he's unable to fathom his mother as anything but a strict traditionalist. And he's brainwashed by Cary Grant's spirit into believing that Nuru, whom uh, Cary Grant describes as a Muslim from the third world, would not understand about his sexuality. Um, and Aleem therefore forces himself to adapt his lifestyle to her expectations, reading his London flat with Grant's help of any books and photographs that could, be, that could be interpreted as gay, and by evicting Giles, his partner, to the spare room in the flat. Nuru is initially disappointed by Aleem's choice of a non-Muslim roommate when she first meets Giles. Um, she tells her son in Kutchi, after being introduced to him, what? There aren't any smiley boys that need a place to live? End of quote. And this scene that Satyavan depicts Nuru's ethnic exclusivism has not been taken very, very well by the smiley community. It is fledged out later in the film when Alim avoids coming out by pretending he's engaged to Giles' sister, Delia, instead, played by Lisa uh, Ruthel Martel, um, who's pictured here on the right. 
this scene depicts being in the closet in a way that is self-consciously articulated through techniques appropriated from classical Hollywood romantic comedies. Nuru is by now steadily pressuring Alim into moving back to Toronto, telling him that he could work for his uncle Hassan, that he could have his own home there. But Alim repeatedly replies that he already has a home in London. And Nuru asks how he expects, and I quote, to attract a nice professional girl when he's living with a lodger, end of quote. Alim retorts that he lives with Charles because he wants to, and finally caves in, um, albeit ambiguously, saying that he's in a relationship with someone. But suddenly Giles and Delia arrive in mid-conversation and Giles assumes that Alim has told Nuru about their relationship. Giles hugs Alim and tells Nuru they were concerned about how she would handle it. Um, an outraged Nuru retorts, who could this frightening creature be I can't handle? End of quote. At this point, Carrie, uh, Carrie Grant's spirit, who is thoroughly enjoying the, the very conflicted scene, silently motions towards Delia. Alim then calls her name and kisses her on the cheek announcing that they're engaged to Delia and Giles' astonishment and to the delight of Cary Grant's ghost. Um, here Rashid is referencing the identity switch plot device of one of his main intertexts, which is the 1940s uh, romantic comedy The Philadelphia Story. In this film, the identities of Catherine Hepburn's character's father and her uncles are swapped in order to avoid social scandal about her estranged father's absence at, at, at her upcoming wedding. So in Touch of Pink, this very technique is self-consciously deployed in order to signal the unresolved tensions between Alim's ethno-religious identity and his sexual orientation. After avoiding coming out um, to his mother, Alim objects, her, objects to her reservations about Delia not being a Muslim by affirming he's no longer a Muslim himself, ironically adding that he's not going to pretend, which is exactly what he's doing. Uh, Nuru is dismayed by this revelation, obviously, and Alim then attempts to downplay it by stating, even more problematically, I just mean I don't believe in God, end of quote. Um, so Rashid is utilizing religion here as a substitute for a debate about sexual orientation that he's not quite prepared to have yet. Um, and this reveals that he needs to come out to himself as both being a Muslim and a homosexual before he can fully reconcile himself with his multifaceted personality. Shamira Megani, a critic, lucidly reads the film's closet as, a, as an ethnicized, as an ethnic space. As she writes, and this is the quotation here, the coming out narrative is one of religion and ethnicity that needs to be overcome in order for the closet to reopen. It is not sexual identity that needs to be discovered, but rather religion and ethnicity that stand in the way of what is already known. Touch of Pink presents religion and ethnicity as ideas that have become overdetermined and that can be undone. In the case of queer diasporic Muslims like Alim, while homosexuality has already been internally accepted and externally acknowledged in some social contexts, it is faith and ethnicity that are precluding the closet from reopening for his ethnic community. Alim's problematic coming out as a heathen, as Cary Grant's spirit playfully labels it, alienates his mother. Nonetheless, Nuru's initial bias against Giles and Delia as non-Muslims is rather ironic too in the film, given the hurdles she has encountered in her own life as a woman of salvation ethnicity in the West. Following her clash with Alim about his faith, Nuru becomes more intimate with Giles, in turn, who takes her out sightseeing in London and who persuade her, persuades her to buy a two-piece suit that reminds her of her favourite film when she was younger, That Touch of Mink, which is the one that uh, the film's title um, references in a pun. This episode of inter-ethnic bonding begins unravelling Nuru's life story and her own experience of metropolitan racism and modernity. For Nuru was the victim of the insidious workings of British racism as a young woman in 1970s London. Later in the film, when she has, uh, sh she shares her own perspective of, on her life with her son, with Alim, um, after Alim's father unexpectedly died um, many years earlier, Nuru recalls, and I quote, for weeks I just felt nothing. Then one afternoon I went to a film. Suddenly there was a way out. Suddenly, I could be Doris Day, flying off to a new life in London. Trouble is, London wasn't interested in any Indian Doris Days, then or now, end of quote. The Hollywood films that Nuru has taught Alim to love do not offer either of them, ultimately, a suitable script to deal with the difficulties of their lives as South Asians in the diaspora, especially regarding Western attitudes to racial difference. Nuru's encounter with Western modernity entails both negative and positive lessons involving a gradual detachment from Muslim traditionalism. She comically tells Salim, and I quote, I'm not completely backwards. 
I know about men with men. I subscribe to Reader's Digest. <laughs> I didn't know about you and Giles. I didn't know that you, ha that you had such feelings for him." End of quote. Nuru's lack of a word for homo homoeroticism demonstrates, as Rashim confirms in an interview, that there's no word for homosexual in Kachi. This demonstrates the relative invisibility of queerness uh, within Ismailism. However, Nuru's gradual acceptance of Aline and Giles' same-sex relationship is also symptomatic of her own experience as a woman in the interstices between tradition and modernity, between the heteronormativity of her Ismaili community and the new knowledges and values of the diaspora. The emotional conversation between Nuru and Aline is prompted by her exposure to the duplicity of her nephew Khaled, played by uh, Raoul Vanegia. Alim asks Khaled whether he's happy about his upcoming wedding. He responds, sure, I'm doing what it's, what's expected of me, what I expect of myself, end of quote. So Khaled is a valued member of his community because he has qualified as a dentist and he has bought his parents an opulent house where they all live together and where he, his future wife is going to join them. Um, as Daftari observes, the fourth Aga Khan has extended <coughs> his father's modernization plans, founding learning programs and institutions which generally benefit all Muslims, and this includes the London-based Institute of Ismaili Studies, the Aga Khan University, founded in Karachi in 1985, so a, a, a salute from the, from the airwaves, and a kind of hosts today here in London. Um, nonetheless, this educational and economic embrace of global modernity still needs to grapple with social and moral traditionalism. Um, after Khaled's stag party, as he's drunkenly rummaging through cupboards looking for alcohol, he makes a sexual pass on Aleem. Um, who rejects his advances, and Aline tells him that he's in love with Giles. Khaled then dismisses such feelings, and I quote, and I warn about strong language coming up here, um, you're in love with a guy? You don't love men, Aline. Fuck them, by all means. Hey, he's just in it for the squirt. I bet he doesn't love you. It's just not normal. Aline then retorts, hey, if you're normal, count me out. Look at you, a closet drunk, closet queer. Name a closet, you're hanging there. End of quote. <laughs> So this is a closet in which Muslims engage in clandestine same-sex acts while upholding a public image thank you, of conventional heterosexuality. Incensed by Lim's accusation, Khaled tells him not to play, and I quote, high and mighty with me. You ever think of your mother? End of quote. Ironically, Nuru has been privy to this encounter. She's been listening in the background. After she makes her presence known, Khaled backtracks, uh, and he says, Auntie, it's not what, you're, what, what you were imagining. And she responds, I'm not imagining, I'm seeing. So what Nuru's eyes become open to is the doubledness of some Muslims' lives, their internalized homophobia and their attempt to conform to familial and communitarian ideas of social propriety, which can mask but not eradicate their queer desires. Sometimes the need to accommodate oneself to these societal strictures involves, like a Hollywood romantic comedy, an ability to pretend. And crucially, Khaled's closeted queerness is disguised not only by himself, but also by his family. When Nuru's sister Dolly, played by Lina <coughs> Sood quite brilliantly actually, notices during her son's wedding that Nuru looks quite troubled, she tells her, and this is a still from another scene in the, in the film, but this is a quote from, from the scene in question, it's all right Nuru, she says, I know about Aline. Our room used to be next to Khaled's and your boy's got quite a set of lungs. I've always given Khaled his freedom, he's given me all this. Look, I want grandchildren, and ice sculptures, and place cards, and so do you, Nuru, don't pretend. But if Khaled can do his duty, there's no reason why Aline can't." End of quote. So Dolly's confession demonstrates that despite her knowledge of Khaled and Aline's queerness discovered early on in their lives, while Nuru lived in London and Aline was left with his aunt's family, uh, her material and familial expectations require his son to count out to the heteronormativity of the Ismaili community. This sexual normative is, normative is constructed as Khaled's duty to his family, which Alim is also expected to fulfill. But as John Esposito um, suggests, uh, Muslim minority communities have faced many hurdles in making the transition it means between countries. Other hurdles continue to exist. But to exist, Muslims and non-Muslim citizens and communities alike face the challenges of living in a pluralistic society." End of quote. The acceptance of homosexuality is one such hurdle, I would argue, that still needs to be overcome as is the acknowledgement of different ideological stumbling blocks for queer citizens of different ethnic backgrounds. Indeed, while Alim's Ismaili community needs to become attuned to his queerness, his partner Giles also needs to tune himself 
to the different social cultural demands placed on Alim as a member of an ethno religious <coughs> of an ethno religious minority. The case of Charles's British family demonstrates that queer Muslims are not the only ones dealing with intergenerational ideological differences. Insidious forms of homophobia also exist within the allegedly accepting spaces of the so-called liberal West. As Megani declares, um, and, I, and this is the second quote, that religion coheres with race and as ethnicity in public discrimination is a key issue in the critical debate about Muslim homophobia. Its premise is that Muslims are inherently anti-gay, while not Muslim um, not Muslim antagonism towards LGBT people is assumed to be unusual. This view of Muslims as invariably homophobic and of Westerners as fully accepting, uh, accepting is qualified by Rashid's depiction of Charles's family. In the scene early on in the film in which Halim and Charles are thrown a surprise party, anniversary party, Charles's mother and father appear awkwardly out of place, thank you, showing their displeasure about celebrating the son's anniversary in a gay club. And uh, Alim says to Carrie Grant's period, can you imagine Charles's mother at the Ram Rod? Imagine my mum here. Although Alim is, is being particularly disparaging about Nuru, this scene evidences how distaste towards queer spaces is not exclusive to Muslims, but includes non-Muslims in the West as well. Okay, I'm going to have to skip a tiny bit. Da, 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 da. I think the, la the last hurdle that, uh, that Alim needs to overcome in the film is the influence of the Cary Grant's spirit figure. Uh, uh, and he's lured by his glamour at first. But he's a, he's a figure that, that still perpetuates some, some stereotypes about, about, about race in Hollywood. Um, and he also encourages superficial social heteronormativity and private, and private transgression. And he favours pretense over truthfulness. But at the end, when he gets rid of him, um, um, Grant Spirit says to Aleem, I envy you. Leave every moment of it. Leave it for me. Be happy, my little samosa, he says, end of quote. Uh, the spirit is envious of Alim because unlike Cary Grant, Alim is now out of the closet and thus he can, has a chance to live his own life in the open as a queer diasporic Ismaili Muslim of East African Salvation heritage. Um, in the end, Alim's shedding of his investment in Hollywood's film's glamorous veneer together with Charles's reconciliation with the ethnic distinctiveness of Alim's experience allow for the relationship to be rekindled. Um, and at the end of the film, um, um, Giles comes up to um, Alim and, say, and asks him, Alim, are we on safe wef wavelength? To which Alim smiles back and responds, we are now. And they kiss and embrace in a balcony that is overlooking misty Toronto before fading um, into pink before the film's credits. And Alim and Giles are now on the same wavelength because of the negotiation of the intersecting demands of traditionalism, modernity and postmodernity, which, which the film does overall. Um, Rashid tells um, Meherali that in making Touch of Pink, he just uh, wanted to um, he just wanted to uh, tell, write, and direct an old-fashioned Hollywood-style movie, but with someone like me in the center, tell kind of my story for a change. Um, that said, Rashid's film does not constitute a complacent hooray to Hollywood. By self-consciously deploying the techniques of classical romantic comedies in a narrative that is zoomed in on a diasporic Ismaili community. Rashid is ultimately queering and diversifying the cinematic mainstream, while tackling also the serious and timely topics of homosexuality and inter-ethnic relationships in a visual narrative that has become gradually much more available to a wide range of global audiences. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alberto. Our final speaker. <clears throat> is Savanj Alaman Garner, and her presentation is, is entitled Gender, Ethnicity, and the Denationalization of Citizenship in Turkey, Shifting Representations of Minority Women in Post-1980 Cinema. Thank you very much. First of all, thank you very much for coming and for choosing this panel over the other ones. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, as uh, Christina uh, said, my title is Gender at This Nation, and I will be talking about uh, shift in uh, representation of shift in representation of minority women in Turkey cinema. But before before uh, my presentation, I, I just would like to give a very brief personal story why I have started this research. 
and also uh, the kind of challenges that uh, you might face, especially if you are coming from a very nationalist uh, education and family background. Uh, I'm from Turkey, I'm originally from Azerbaijan, and I'm working on Armenian and Kurdish minorities. So, you know, those who are familiar with the history of Turkey and the conflict between Azerbaijan and Armenia, obviously this is quite interesting and a big challenge, obviously, for me. Um, especially when I was thinking about the reasons why, you know, what are the inspirations, why I started working on the subject is uh, probably, I would say, my grandmother. Um, as I mentioned, because my family is very nationalist, and uh, when I think about the education I received, especially during the 1980s, you know, you're reading this national anthem every day, every Monday, and every Friday, and also you're, you, you, you're reading this um, Turkish, uh, Turkish anthem, it's like Turkum, Dorium, Çalışkanım, you know, I'm Turkish, I'm right, I'm hardworking, and my response <coughs> is save the republic, you know, you kind of receive this education and you see the picture of, you know, founder of Turkish Republic in every book, and your family is constantly trying to teach you how you're great, you know, as a Turkish nation, it is really difficult to open up your mind about the minorities, and especially the Kurdish and Armenians and other, you know, Greeks and Jews uh, and their situation. And I want to give a very little anecdote, um, just recently happened before my grandmother died. Whenever she was angry, for instance, uh, she was always cursing people as you idiot uh, Armenian offspring, although the person was Turkish. Doesn't matter, regardless of your, you know, religious and, be and uh, ethnic background, this was the curse that they were using. Either your Armenian offspring or your Greek offspring, and doesn't matter where you are from. So, you know, I came to England and started to do my PhD, and it, it was nothing to do with minorities, but I was always wondering, you know, curious about what is this animosity, this hostility, and I wanted to find out myself. So it is a learning journey. Still, it's a learning journey for me, and I wanted to share, you know, this with you. And today, uh, the discussion I will be, uh, I will be talking about, as I said, the treatment of this minority woman in Turkey cinema. And uh, there are two films that I will be talking about very briefly. One of them is Handy Pictures Büyük Adam Küçük Aşk that was made in 2001, and for Ms. Gülüklü um The Diamonds of um, Mrs. Salcom, which was made in 1999. So this period is very important because we see the emergence of a new Turkish uh, cinema. But some people don't like this title Turkish because of the, you know, the word that it indicates. So sometimes they refer to as the cinema movement, and sometimes cinema from Turkey. So we see a different definition of this emergence of new, new uh, Turkish cinema. And these two films I've chosen particularly are representative of this movement because we see a plural and polyphonic, you know, structure of films that you see different diverse identities, the minorities that you don't really see in the previous pre-1980, 1990s. But, and also the other reason that I've chosen these films is that the representation of minority women. So now in the first film we see this representation of Armenian uh, woman, um, Nora, uh, in Salkım Hanım and Taniyeleri, and the other one is Hejar. So the first film, um, I will be talking about uh, this later, but they represent this film study understudy of a reconstruction of the points of view of non-Muslim women, and they represent the challenge, the stereotypical portrayal of the non-Muslim woman as the other of the ideal Turkish woman, which I will be describing later. Um, and thereby disordering or ending the monolithic and homogenizing discourse of Turkish nationalism. Now, the founders of the Turkish Republic saw cinema as an ideological tool for supporting Turkism as a political project and the unifying and homogenizing objective of nation building that they idealized. The realization of this project included process of assimilation and exclusion of non-Turkish numbers and others in order to reconstitute a Turkish national identity. So as a result, Turkish citizenship came to be formulated as membership to a national state defined on the basis of one nation, uh, one religion, and one language, namely Turkish uh, Sunni sect of Islam. Again, if you're from a Shia sect like me, then you're still considered as a minority. 
and also ethnically you, you need to be from a Turkish background. So those who did not fit into this were generally silenced or categorized as others with the narratives of um, the nation. <coughs> Uh, women's debate, when we look at this period, what was happening uh, regarding the women's situation is that it took another turn during the nation building process. So the consolidation of a one nation, Turkish Republic, in place of a multi-ethnic and multi-religious Ottoman uh, Empire took place in opposition to a number of others. An integral part of the construction of modern Turkish citizenship was a discourse of ideal Turkish womanhood. So that was constructed in opposition to the fallen uh, frivolous and sexualized non-Muslim, non-Turkish woman, and associated with a concept of a, I'm sure you heard it very often, modern and modern but modest uh, womanhood. So, what does it mean? What do we understand from that? Basically, in both public literature, pub popular culture discourse, this image of near womanhood suggested that you should have respect for the community over the individual. Patriotism and faith in education, but this education is not uh, specifically for you, but to, in order to be able to uh, educate and raise the national generation and for the betterment of society. And obviously, you need to be a good wife and good mother. So for that, we understand that you need to be nationalist, you need to be able to educate a child to teach them how to be nationalist Turkish. And the most important, but probably that, you need to be asexual, which means basically that you need to suppress your femininity, anything that is related to or associated with sexuality in public. So this ideology of citizenship was echoed as well in Turkish cinema during the early years of Turkish Republic, where we can see some of its gendered characteristics. And the Turkish portrayals of non-Muslim women or non-Turkish women that appeared in the cinema of the early 20th century generally served as one-dimensional and negative others who are set against this ideal womanhood. So the other of minority women was an important element, obviously, in Turkish cinema. Therefore, um, minority women's representation in this film is often as a form of femme fatale with loose morals. They can have sex, they can have affair, and again, in brackets, uh, I was just thinking about, you know, how this, uh, this research is still very interesting for me because since yesterday I've been listening to, you know, presentations and my colleagues usually talk about the representation of Muslims in the Western media. <coughs> and that is more or less in a similar way how non-Muslims are actually represented in a Muslim context, in a Muslim media. So more or less, you know, uh, from an oriental perspective, it's similar. They are trying to demonize non-Muslims uh, and non-Muslim women and how uh, you know, they represent the immorality, sexuality, and uh, trying to, of course, uh, show the superior or positive aspects of the uh, ideal Turkish womanhood here. For example, there are a couple of films made in that film, Ahmed Fein's Murebbiye, uh, that was again during that time, 1919, um, and it's actually uh, the governess. And um, there's this nun, French governess, who come into an Ottoman mansion, and uh, the film is based on actually a novel written by Sayyid Rahmi Gülpana, one of the leading Turkish authors. And basically this French nun is coming and uh, seducing all the men in the house, including the imam. <laughs> so, you know, that's a very exaggerated kind of image of non-Muslim women. In other words, you know, it doesn't matter who you are, if they always are open to this kind of... Um, you know, activities. Another another film, Istanbul, the Bifar Diyaya Ashk, a love tragedy in Istanbul, producer during this time. Um, it's just, again, a similar story, you know, a non-Muslim woman coming to Istanbul and having an affair with men and using them for her own benefits. We see this kind of images very often in this in this kind of, you know, uh, in the films produced during that time period. Again, when we look at the Kurdish woman, not very different. Turkish cinema until the 1990s portrayed Kurds as Turks, actually, which means that their depiction has been one-dimensional, generally featuring poor, illiterate people, or as they used to describe, mountain Turks, not really Kurds, because this word wasn't allowed to use in, in Turkish uh, popular culture. And uh, the Kurdish language, it was almost impossible to hear it until the 1970s you know, uh, with the Yilmaz Güney, one of the leading Kurdish directors, probably you heard. Then there's a turning point in Turkish cinema. 
So we see this kind of typical, stereotypical uh, representation of Kurdish uh, people and women, and uh, this has been part of an official denial of Kurds, uh, they suggested, as a separate entity within Turkey. The Republican regime believed that the Kurds were, I quote, more prone to assimilation than non-Muslim minorities. And it prohibited all signs of a separate Kurdish identity, including the public use of Kurdish and deported Kurdish families who were considered as a threat to the security of Western Turkey. The states afforded linguistic homogenization and also manifested by the campaign Citizens Speak Turkish, um, which was launched by the Student Association of Faculty of um, Faculty of Law at Istanbul University in 1928, uh, and the campaign was quickly popularized by the press, through national and unofficial publications and other forms of media, through the national education system. Now, from the 1990s, this is changing. The notion of citizenship promoted by Kamalist Turkish nationalism came to face a number of challenges, especially the emergence of women's movement. In 1980s, this is the first independent women's movement in Turkish history. Because when we look at the feminist history in Turkey before the 1980s, we see this state feminism, or Kamalist feminism, as some would describe, which was a top-down process. Women were granted their rights in 1930-34, respectively, you know, uh, elections, and then they were given privileges, they, they were encouraged to go to schools. But still, there is no discussion, no challenge of how this Kamalist regime actually, or Kamalist feminism, sorry, did not really challenge the traditional gender roles. The patriarchal mentality was still there. And it wasn't really for the individual development of women, as I mentioned. So when we come to 1980s, 1990s, then we see this independent feminist woman free from the direct influence of the government. And we see the emergence of civil societies. Again, this is uh, in goes in parallel with the literature and cinema that we see these changes. And again, uh, Turkish official uh, candidacy for EU, which was a huge impact on this uh, change in the law and the perception of minorities. Now, when we come to the uh, films from the early 1990s, then we see movies um, showing the problems faced by minority women, such as Salkum Hanum and Tani um, I'll just skip to the um, a film now. The film takes place in the late 1930s and 1940s, during which the official propagation of the new nationalist refrain, Turkey exclusive for the Turks, in quotation. Accompanied by accompanied the newly established Turkish Republic's project of nation building. And as I mentioned before, ethnic and religious minorities were expect, expected to adapt to the unifying ideology of the new republic. The film portrays Turkey during this period with an emphasis on how minorities were affected, especially by the notorious property tax of 1942. Again, um, those who are familiar with the Turkish history, this, this tax, property tax, uh, led to the destruction of many non-Muslims because um, it was a kind of uh, Turkish Turkish press started a vicious campaign against Jewish and Christian businessmen during that time, who survived the severe economic crisis of 1939 and 42. So, how much a person how much a person would pay depended on their ethnic and religious background. So, let's say that there were three lists were made: one for Muslims, one for non-Muslims, and the other one for Dönmez. So Dönmez are those categories who converted to Muslim, and they were considered worse, actually, because they were, although they are Muslim, because they were just in between, and they just they just wanted the best of both worlds. So when it comes to the tax that they were they had to pay, uh, non-Muslims were paying uh, almost up to ten times more than the Muslims, but Dönmez were still paying double uh, double the Muslims paid. Mm -hmm. So still there wasn't a big difference between you know, Muslims and those who converted. So this film is about this, how this property tax actually led the destruction of non-Muslims and what kind of uh, challenges they faced. And we see the family, uh, Halit Bey, and also um, a new um, a person coming from the Anatolia Durmush with his wife, Nimet, and uh, they basically use this property tax uh, to be wealthy, and at the end, Lunch Bay buys everything that belongs to Halit Bay. What is interesting in this film is that Nora, the depiction of this um, um, female character, she is the wife of uh, Halit Bay, and uh, she is actually this. This film is based on a book written by Ilmaz Karakoğlu, one of uh, the prime, uh, 
were the ministers in that time, but originally the characters are Jewish. But in the film they were they were changed into Armenians just to for some people just to draw attention how this Armenian issue is still a taboo, uh, something that is not really discussed um, in Turkish history. So Nora, when we look at the depiction of Nora, uh, Armenian woman, we see uh, that she is representing the moral. She is representing the what not good wife and good not mother, she, she's trying to be mother, a good wife and moral woman in opposition to Nesibe, the Turkish character, Turkish female character, who is actually seducing men, who's having, having an affair with Halit Bey, with married men. So it's just the opposite reverse, you know, a stereotypical uh, depiction of women we see. Non-Muslim is the good one, and Muslim is the uh, sexualized one, which is a radical depiction of, you know, women in that period. And again, when we come to Hejar, Hejar is again one of the radical films made in 2004. And that's the first film, actually, that is dealing with the restriction of Kurdish language uh, in a daring manner. Because you see this, there's a five-year-old girl uh, who lost her family in a um, you know, Kurdish guerrilla between, a, between the government and a Kurdish guerrilla. And then she's staying with her, one, of her parent, one of her relatives. But what happens is that she ended up staying with this judge who's a retired judge and he's representing Turkish nationalism, official Turkish nationalism. He's very strict nationalist. And when he finds out that he she doesn't speak Turkish, she doesn't know Turkish and she's she only speaks Kurdish, then he immediately changes his understanding and tolerant approach to her. She, he's constantly trying to, you know, go in between whether he should uh, uh, turn her into the police. So we see this tension constantly going on between these two characters. But what is interesting is that this Kurdish character, Hejar, five-year-old girl, Kurdish girl, she doesn't surrender to this old judge that he's constantly trying to teach her Turkish, but she is constantly rejecting this, mm -hmm. although there's a risk that he would turn her into the police. And it's a very lovely movie. I still, you know, for those who are interested, I really strongly suggest, recommend that you watch it. And in the end, what happens? It's very interesting, actually. This retired judge who is constantly reading Jumuriyet Gazetesi, which is a representative of official discourse, and watching uh, news uh, showing how our soldiers are great. Uh, you know, our soldiers are long live. Our soldiers constantly watching this kind of news and reading. In the end. He is understanding, he's accepting the existence of this Kurdish identity because they get they get used to each other. Of course, I can't give you all the details. I and mean, when she finds out, when actually there's another relative that uh, she wants to go back, Edo, when he comes to pick her up, there's a very emotional, uh, you know, atmosphere going on between this old retired uh, judge and the little girl. So they are becoming like a father and daughter. And in the end, he actually wants to adopt her, uh, although, she, again, she doesn't speak Kurdish, but he is trying to speak Kurdish to her, which is radical for these people, for this kind of nationalist people. He is trying to learn some Kurdish word, like, Negri, don't go, please stay with me, uh, although before he was stronger, pausing this. So all this, uh, when we look at this depiction of you know, radical uh, stereotypes and depictions, we see how there's a change in Turkish, Turkish cinema. There are some women filmmakers as well who are trying to reverse this man case, <coughs> trying to uh, you know raise the concerns of modern women and minorities, but obviously they're always facing the challenges, especially in terms of receiving funding from the government, from the uh, uh, Ministry of Culture. Having said that in brackets, this film, for example, Hejar, was supported, funded actually by Ministry of Culture, but but. It was later because of the complaint coming from the police, because they suggested that it was shown in a very derogatory manner, that police was shown very brutal. They banned the film. <sighs> Just after one year it was produced, and you know, that then the, the director Handani Pekcu was arrested. But later, of course, they, they dropped the charge because they couldn't find any evidence, and again, you know, it was on the screen. But not so many people in Turkey know about this kind of films uh, because they are not really promoter, let me say. So as a result, um, if I go to my conclusion, uh, so yes, analyzing this kind of film, or Heja, so I try to suggest that, that analyzing films such as this helps us develop insights 
into the shift in our contested discourse of Turkish national and cultural integrity and how it is related to perception of minority women in Turkey. And they allow us to develop our own understanding of the roles of minority women as integral components of nationalist ideologies and the attempt to foster a new national cultural identity after the 1990s. Thank you very much for your attention. Question? Uh, I'll go to the question for you. Uh, Hello. Aside from the descriptive side of the bill, what I was really interested in is what was having kind of an analytical assessment of how uh, somebody would view sexuality and homosexuality in Islam. And it reminds me of this. Recent book by Joseph Massad, Islam and Liberalism, is one of his chapters is about sexuality and homosexuality. Mm -hmm. And his argument is that this perception that Muslims, now it, it applies to Adam of Islam as well, are against homosexuality, and this is something traditional and the modern world is promoting homosexuality, is historically flawed. And he provides a massive case mm -hmm. that it is incidentally the West. The modern West, I mean, even after the Enlightenment, mm -hmm. which is anti homosexuality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you look at historically at Muslim communities, they seem to be okay. And then suddenly, in the modern world, now, now this is the post colonial narrative, mm -hmm. the Muslims are depicted as people who are against human rights, against women's rights, and of course, there's apparently plenty of evidence for it if you look at it from a verification perspective. And then they suddenly become people who have nothing to do with homosexuality, and, and there is, they, are, they, are, they are depicted as homophobic. Yeah. Now, my sense is that when you look at the movie, it is made in the spirit of a colonial orientalist narrative of what a Muslim or an Ismaili is about, because there is suddenly a sharp distinction between what is perceived as a traditional community, a close community, and what is considered to be an open one, a modern one, an advanced one, which openly welcomes homosexuality. So, what is what, where do we draw the, how do we start critically assessing this production as such? That's a good question, except um, I don't think it's a colonial vision of Ismailism. And if you look at Rashid's film uh, work overall, I mean, he, he, he wrote and directed several short films before uh, Touch <coughs> of Pink was released. Films like Surviving Sabu, in which he takes to task the colonial gaze that is placed on on um, on Indian figures in classic classical Hollywood films. Um, there's a film called Stag, in which uh, he he takes to task the enduring power relations between uh, British Muslim men and white British men who can't who can't get over the fact that these uh, these Muslim men want to have lives beyond the white British um, as well. So I don't think. I don't think it's a colonial text at all, particularly because Rashid is is someone who's still invested in him, in his Ismaili community and who's um, nobody comes comes off particularly badly in the film, and even the characters who you know even someone like like his aunt um, his aunt Dolly, um, she's looked on fondly. She's 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 portrayed not unsympathetically either. So I think he's treading quite a light. Uh, quite a light line because it's a romantic comedy as well, and and in the film, I mean the Cary Grant character, Anna, um, I don't know if we can put the image up again. He dressed up, he dresses up like Ganga Din for the for the Ismaili wedding, and uh, and Alim is very very visibly uh, uh, overwhelmed by this and going, like, you know, what are you doing? You know, you can't you can't do this. I think um, I think the work of Rashid. Um, is very much in the line of the early work of someone like Hanif Qureshi, mm -hmm. who was, was yeah, who was both. And he said, you know, I came to. He said, uh, he said to me that he came to London because uh, he'd watched my beautiful Laundrette, and he thought, oh, it's great that this is a place in which such a film can be made. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, he unites the consciousness about the the colonial colonial history that he's very, still very much conscious of. But also the diversification and the and the contradictions and the and the melange of the diaspora, because she realizes that you know being diasporic is never easy and it's never one-sided and you can't compartmentalize identities. Sometimes they clash, sometimes 
they merge in in contradictory and problematic ma in problematic ways. But even I think among the Smileys. Sorry. Even amongst the Smileys. Yeah, and I mean the film the film is posits a case of a family that overcomes homophobia, and that uh, uh, a mother who learns to live with the son's difference and doesn't reject his son. Um, and and Rashid, Rashid is very conscious that some a community like the Smiley community, for instance, um, has less trouble with issues of coming out when people eventually coming out. Um, and I th I thought about this, and I think it possibly has to do with the fact that um, Ismailis don't subscribe to a literalist interpretation of Islam. Um, a lot of the of the post-colonial homophobia that is going on in Muslim majority and Muslim minority countries has a lot to do with a very definite interpretation of the Quran um, that has been, as you as you very rightly said, uh, turned up in sometime in the 20th century, um, and that is inherited from colonialism, colonial homophobia, colonial law as well, and from a sense that by being anti-gay we're being very properly Muslim and very properly Islamic. Um, so, um, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm rambling a bit now, but I... I... <laughs> Not to the point, that was precisely what I wanted to hear. Okay, okay. I thanks. have a very brief follow-on question yes. for okay. that. Um, there is one character who makes a distinction between hom uh, same-sex practice and, and homosexuality as a kind of mm. cultural construct. Yeah. Is there any more of that? Is there a sense that there's this, lo that there's this more specific kind of practice that you mean in the film or in the in, film? In the film, there's, there's one. You know, you, you don't marry women. You. I think that that whole family who's putting up this front that he that Caleb needs to get married and so does everybody else. Uh, they're the ones who seem well. Delia, no, sorry, the aunt Dolly, his Caleb's mother, seems to uh, to see homosexuality almost like a phase or like a, or like a byproduct of of living in the West, so you know this is something we have to live with, but we have to conform to what our community and our society so expects then, from us. It's not really homosexuality, oh, then I see. it's a kind of moment of same-sex sex practice, but not homosexuality mm. as the identity. That's right, and that's what Nuru has to come to terms with, the feelings involved, the, the partnership involved. There. I have a question for Celine. Since you, you, you touched on the issue of uh, women filmmakers, you said that the sun were beginning to emerge. And I was just interested whether you were able to gauge whether they're having any impact in changing perceptions of, of, of women and, and, and reflecting the modern reality. Um, the two films that I've, I've, I've talked about actually, uh, two directors, London Picture and Thomas Gilmore. They are also among this uh, new generation, you know, that they started and contributed to this new cinema movement. But when we look at the number of women filmmakers, it's very limited in Turkey. Uh, especially uh, when we look at the history, let's say, the first Turkish film, the first Turkish film produced in 1914, uh, as the funnest in the demolition of Russian monuments in St. Stephen's. But, uh, you know, when we look at the films produced from since then until up until the 1980s, over 4,000 films were produced and only around 50 were produced or, for, you know, directed by women filmmakers. This was mainly probably something to do with the conservative values of Islamic society, obviously, because, as you know, women weren't allowed to act or even go to the cinema. And uh, during 1909, for example, some fundamentalists, you know, they went to the hall of the cinema and they threatened women to, you know, stab them if they tried to go. So women were either disguised as a man, you know, to go to the cinema, and they were petitioned in the uh, cinema hall, so women on one side and uh, men on, so on one side. But this, this, I mean, it's changing, as I said, especially when we come to the 80s, 90s, especially there is a big activity attempt from the diaspora women, for example, Aisha Polat, and they are trying to show the Kurdish minority women, you know, uh, trying to raise their concern. And again, uh, you know, uh, in Turkey, Thomas Kif, Nola Handani, Pekci, Yeshun Stolo is a very uh, well-known name abroad, not in Turkey that were that much, but abroad. You know, she also received uh, awards for making uh, really radical films like Journey to the Sun. It's one of the, you know, well-known films, uh, trying to show, uh, you know, the minority's point of view. Um, 
but if we ask whether they changed uh, completely, uh, you know, they all created a new genre. Well, according to scholars like uh, you know Gerudo Masquerin, for example, well-known name, the answer is no. We still have a long way to go. Alberto, I just wanted to make a quick comment about um, you know when you were talking about how it's uh, how uh, homosexuality is looked at in the Ismaili community. Um, as a Canadian Ismaili. Um, you know, I've seen a lot of change, and I think you have to think about also the context in which they live. Right. Because the East African diaspora that came to Canada uh, now 40 years later um, is very accepting. So, uh, you know, because of the context in which we live, the Canadian society, multicultural, social justice, you know, everyone belongs. So um, I often see friends, family, people that I know who are openly out, uh, you know, the aunties will say, oh, he's a good boy and his friend is also a good boy. Mm -hmm. You know, so that kind of thing is accepted now. Mm -hmm. And I've even lately uh, heard discussions about, uh, you know, there's been a, a lot of effort made to bring non-Ismaili spouses into the community and make it welcoming to them, including the, uh, the homosexual spouse. Um, and so there's been this sort of conversation about, you know, Karim and Karim getting married, and how is that going to work? Mm -hmm. So there's, there, I think there's a lot of openness, but in the last 10 years, there has been a lot of Jamaat now entering from Pakistan, from India, uh, you know, we've had uh, an Afghan diaspora as well. And so when they come from that sort of more, um, uh, you know, more orthodox environment, mm -hmm. uh, they're finding it very difficult. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's almost kind of this thing about, oh, these East African Ismailis are, you know, they've just integrated too much. <laughs> and they're too accepting, mm -hmm. while we, uh, you know, are still staunch. Mm -hmm. So even within the Ismaili community, you've got these social... Yeah. Yeah. But then an element of class as well. Yeah, there's an element of class, but also um, the element of uh, where we come from and, and, you know, the stratification of which is really the best Ismaili practice. So it depends on where they come from, because mm -hmm. an Ismaili in Canada wouldn't blink twice if mm. your homosexual partner came with you right. Right, to, to, to pray or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, if, if it was, a, for example, a Pakistani family event and someone brought their homosexual partner, there, there might be a stir. So it depends on where they come from and their culture. Okay, thank you so very much for that. I mean, in the in the film, and it's something that I couldn't cover in my presentation, yeah. uh, Giles joins uh, joins um, Alim at Khaled's wedding. Yes. And Alim, if you remember, suddenly kisses Giles. Yes. And everybody just looks on, and and his and and his uncle goes, I think I just need a coke, yeah. and goes to get a coke. But nobody mentions <laughs> anything to do with the fact that they're a same-sex couple. Yes. Is more the act of kissing, which is still frowned upon in in, in public and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I think, oh, well, all I all I can say is that the film is quite uh, inspired by Rashid's own experience, yes. and it was written in the 1990s. Uh, I mean, yeah. he grew up in 1970s Toronto, and he describes. And uh, it's very accurate to that. Time. Yeah, yes. yeah. Um, but but it's, it's I mean it's great to hear that things have moved on. Changed a lot. Yeah, yeah. since then. Thank you so much for your comments. Just one more, one more comment before you put your okay, very fresh, is looking at London mm -hmm. as that uh, space in which that liberation or that uh, awareness, and I think that's a very important part of the whole story of the mm. uh, interaction between LGBT <laughs> communities and ethnicity and all the mystery. Mm -hmm. So I think that's an important part of. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I mean, there is a bit of a sense in the film that uh, Alim is escaping mm -hmm. his community by going to London, uh, and uh, and I mean he becomes much more himself when he's in London. But by his mother's visit, forces him to confront, not having come out to her, um, and eventually he's. I think what's even more important is his journey back to Canada, when he follows her after they 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 fall out. And how he becomes a lot more invested in his community again, mm -hmm. and there's in the preparation towards his cousin's wedding, um, he wants to attend the henna night, mm -hmm. 
and he's watching from the window, and his his uncle says, "No, you can't watch this. This is for women only." He's but he says it's kind of lovely. You don't you don't want to be here. He says, "Uncle, I want to see," because he's rediscovering um, his uh, his connection with his own um, ethno religious community. Mm -hmm. So uh, so that journey of return, I think, is quite quite an important one as well. So thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, my question is about the rule of women in a uh, small screen in Turkey, mostly in Syria, which we are seeing in Afghanistan. And so yes, yeah, something like that. Uh, it's showing still a very traditional and weak role of women in Turkey. And when we are going to the social media mm -hmm. and to, to Blogs which women, Turkish women, are writing. Mm -hmm. It's much more stronger. If uh, somebody remember the, the campaign, smile campaign, thousands of thousand women in Turkey mm -hmm. they react on the comment of Erdogan about to not sm smile in society or the having campaign. But again, when we are seeing the serials or, or the movies in the small screen, the women are isolated in the houses. They are with wives, they are with uh, lovers, or they are with sisters, and still men are in the center of attention mm -hmm. in small screen. What do you think? Why it is uh, still so hard for women to establish themselves in the cinema? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think this is more or less going back to what I was saying. Um, uh, still, the majority of popular culture, say the films produced, the literature produced, you know, they, they are not all in line with the official discourse. And as I mentioned, that you know, there's still impact of this um, state feminism. I would still say, it, um, you know, they're in enforcing the roles of wife or women that that center of the you know private sphere rather than the public. But as you mentioned, uh, we also uh, see. Uh, different films like uh, this ones that I mentioned, not mainly in the soap operas because soap operas. This is a problem with the funding again. You know, with this this fi women filmmakers it doesn't have to be women actually. You know, ma male filmmakers as well. They cannot easily access to funding in Turkey, so they have to either apply for uh, Council of Euro U European, you know, Euromich or some other external funding sources. Mm -hmm. So that's why majority of Turkish uh, population do not know, are not aware of these radical films that are made and you know receiving awards in abroad. And again, I mentioned uh, you know this denationalization process in Turkey that is started you know during 1990s. So this has is changing the understanding of citizenship now, which is having an impact on these films. So in other words, the citizenship is not only having a passport. Or you know, being a member of community or nation, it's also having the rights to be different. It's having the rights to be different from the majority of nation. And people, there is also in the in the soap opera, as I would say, like Ottoman Empire. I don't know if you're following this. There was this very popular Turkish soap opera, Muhteşem um, uh, Yüzyıl. You know, uh, magnificent century. Yeah, magnificent century. That's right. So there is also kind of tendency to encourage people to remember the past identities. The identities that they were suppressed in the past, mm -hmm. that multicultural, multi ethnic Ottoman history, this is also defined as Ottoman nostalgia. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. So, this is, I see it as a positive uh, step actually, in a sense that people are now opening their minds towards those minorities that were suppressed in the past. Mm -hmm. That they remember that they were actually multicultural, <coughs> that they, they were Greeks, there were Armenians, there, there are Kurdish people who were living and they are living together now. So. And this kind of you know soap operas or films uh, leading people to consider even you know the option of living together is a major step, radical step, I think, in terms of change in people's minds. So. Hi, um, I also have a question for Sevinc. So you presented the shifting representations of minority women uh, in a presentation, yet I have difficulty in in putting together mm -hmm. the representation of non-Muslim women mm -hmm. and the Kurdish women. Because mm -hmm. as you also said, and rightly so, in the presentation, non-Muslim women have been sexualized. And I don't think, correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. Kurdish women have not been sexualized in the way non-Muslim no. no. women no. have been sexualized no. in Turkey. So I understand that they have both have been 
misrepresented. Uh, misrepresented, they have become others, yet I can't, analytically speaking, I don't see the reason why to put together mm -hmm. you know, these two groups mm -hmm. as, as minor representation of minority women, because I think mm -hmm. they have been represented very very differently yes, and, and, and still yes. are represented very differently. Yes. Yes. So yes. what commonality or, 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 or common you know, thing that you see well, uh, actually, between the two? Thank you very much for this question, because this is something that actually people still you know, I'm not sure about the position of Kurdish minority in Turkey. One of the main things I would say is that now when we look at the Turkish situation uh, regarding its position to minorities, I would say that Turkey is still stuck with this, you know, Lausanne Treaty, which was signed in 1923. And rather than, you know, following these international, you know, laws and developments on minorities, they are still looking at this situation from this limited point of view which was a treaty signed between Turkish Republic and the Allied forces in World War One. So according to this treaty, those who are not Muslim are considered minorities in Turkey. And they were given some uh, privileges, some rights, you know, to, to practice their religion, to be able to speak their language. Whereas when it comes to the Kurdish minorities or non-Turkish, let's, let's say non-Turkish, because they are not only Kurdish. I am one of those minorities, I would say, because I'm Azerbaijani and I belong to the Shia uh, of Islam. And the, as I mentioned that because, you know, coming from this family influence, I see my grandparents, were, you know, uh, worshipping in a different way, different from the majority of Turkish people who are also Muslim. So I was always questioning this myself, why? But Kurdish or non-Turkish, non-Turkish people are not considered minorities because the idea is that if they are given privileges like the ones non-Muslims, then this would lead to the disintegration of the state. And that means, you know, uh, these multicultural identities, diverse identities in Turkey should be undermined in order to create a homogenic or, in Benedict Anderson's, uh, you know, famous concept, imagined community. Mm -hmm. So they want to keep it in that way. What I was trying to do is that actually, no, they are also minorities. In a way that, you know, when we look at the cinematic, for example, that's my focus, uh, how they are presented in Turkish cinema. The commonality is that they are misrepresented, because as uh, Bahar mentioned, Turkish women, you know, they are often represented um, presented in the so-called press as, uh, you know, in a traditional role, which is not true. As you can see, that there are so many professions, so many active women in Turkey. You know, they are challenging all this hegemonic understanding, even the Turkish identity now. This is similar in a way for Kurdish women, because we see the Kurdish feminist movement. Kurdish feminist activity, which is active since 1980s, 90s. And these Kurdish women are trying to raise their voices, saying that we are not what we are, what you're seeing on those films. We are not like the poor, illiterate women who are always, you know, obedient to her husband and not know anything. So these women are also trying to uh, show a different perspective. And the films, for example, the film I mentioned, Hejar, and Handling the Pictures, trying to show something from their own perspective something that has not been done before 1980s, something that has not been really, you know, dared to show from their own perspective. So this little girl I mentioned, even Sarkina, I didn't have time to talk about it, there's an assimilated Kurd working as a housemaid in the house, and she speaks Turkish, but when she tries to speak Kurdish to little girl, the judge is always telling her off, saying that, don't you dare speak in Kurdish in my house. So these women are secretly challenging his authority in the house. And some people even, you know, interpret the ending of the film saying that when the little girl is going, there's a good attachment between them, there's a kind of sense that she will come back to him to visit him again. And some, some critics uh, suggest that this is the kind of indication to, to say that maybe there, it's a, you know, there will be a blossom in the relationship between Kurdish community and Turkish community, you know, because they are both representing different sides there. And there might be a possibility. So these are kind of radical representation of Kurdish women as well as non-Muslim non women. Not in the same direction, but in the sense that misrepresented people. Yeah, so just, I mean, just a tiny... Uh, 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 so same, same question, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I really I, I appreciate your explanation. But I'm still not clear. I mean, I understand 
So the, so the, the non-Muslim woman, obviously, okay. and I think you pointed that really well, mm -hmm. that it's actually not her non-Muslim, it's actually generally it's an extra Christian. Mm -hmm. So it's like that, that's why it's like she's very much like the Western woman who mm -hmm. comes in uh, and uh, sure. is a, a, a sexually um, dangerous society. Mm -hmm. But um, what is it about the Kurdish woman in which her femaleness is significant rather than her Kurdishness, in the sense that isn't this argue from what I'm gathering, and I have mm -hmm. some of the other film you have the other films have not mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, which I'm sure illustrate this, but isn't it at some level the issue that it's the that Kurds are essentially backward Turks? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. mountain trick Turkish thing, mm -hmm. that they're backward Turks mm -hmm. and that not only that, but at the end of the day, they they are Muslim. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that makes a huge difference in terms of their in, in the way they are misrepresented. Yes, yes, so the issue being is it what about it is the gender in there, as opposed to just a matter of the herd and acceptance of the story? Well, I try to touch that up all. Like when we look at this feminist movement, yes, yeah. let's say, you know, the 1990s women, we see the third wave of feminism emerging in Turkey. And this has been inspired mainly by Kurdish feminist movements. And they are emerged, they are uh, organized by Kurdish females, not males. So this. The impact of the Kurdish feminist movement is also influencing the films that are produced. Because if there is not, if they were happy with the way they presented in the films, there was no point of trying to raise their voices. But it is a fact that you know, in terms of gender, obviously, there's, it's not a threat to the society because not all of them, majority of them are Muslim. But what they are trying to say is that we are not also, you know, poor literate maids all the time. Or, you know, we, we have an identity, like this in this film, the, the judge does not even refer to this little girl with her name, because she's uh, Kurdish, her name's Hejar. It's only in the end, when there's this, you know, attachment of that, she says, what's your name? And where she's kind of about to leave, and where she says Hejar, he says, oh, what a beautiful name you have. And they've spent all this time together in the house, he never asked the name. So this is, they see, you know, females as well as males as a threat to the society. Now, males are represented as the barbaric mountain Turks. Females are represented as the illiterate mates. But you know, there is an attempt to change this. It's, we don't we don't have to see it in a way that they are threat to the morality of society. They are also seen threat to the integration of the state. You know, and they want to suppress their language, their identity, their feminism. And there is a clash between Kurdish families and Turkish families as well. Because Kurdish families suggesting that, no, you don't represent our concern because we are double marginalized. You know, does it make sense? We are, we are suppressed, not only as Kurdish, but also women. And who is raising our voices? Who is talking about Kurdish women? You know? Who is saying that we are also suppressed in our tribal patriarchal society as well as in Turkish society? So this is a triple oppression actually. Mm -hmm. Kurdish, woman in Turkish society, woman in Kurdish society. So these films are just tiny little you know, steps going towards this huge challenge in the future. Mm -hmm. It is a tiny step indeed, because yes. what um, what does it tell us that um, the only representation of yes. um, Kurdish women mm -hmm. is through a little girl? And that, you know, so I would like to sure. picture, uh, yes, picture because... that. And, and one more thing. Um, earlier, I think it was a uh, gentleman sitting here uh, asked the question, and then uh, mm -hmm. your answer. Are you talking about 1909, the uh, restrictions due to the, you know, the Muslim, um, Islamic nature, um, etc., in terms of um, watching movies, etc., women's suppression, etc., and then you kind of like jump in the answer to 1980s. Mm -hmm. So the uh, suggestion seemed to me like it was the, it was Islam mm -hmm. that kind of made it uh, impossible for. Uh, women directors to come about. Mm -hmm. um, well, um, so I don't know if you, you know if you want to uh, elaborate on that a little bit. I because I think we should correct the um, record a little bit on that, especially mm -hmm. when 
it is fusion cleaning. You know, patriarchy is, of course, you know, one of the issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, 1909 is, is definitely not the Republic of Turkey yet. That's that. Well, and then yeah. an, another issue is um, um, in the 1960s, 70s, when the Turkish cinema was mm -hmm. uh, so big, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, 300, yes. whatever, yes. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. a year. And those mm -hmm. movies were, most of them were like soft born movies sure. for men. So, mm -hmm. of course, male directors are, you know, uh, shooting these movies. Mm -hmm. And so, Maybe, you know, it's not necessarily Islam, but it's almost like a Hollywood style um, that's um, appealing to uh, young adults and men's sexual desires, kind of, you that's know, dramatic thinking. So. Yes, that's true. Thank you very much again. But because of our limited time, obviously, I can't go every detail, every period of Turkish society. But when I mentioned 1910, I mentioned the emergence of Turkish film. So in that time, 1910, that is the birth of national understanding. We, we are not in the 1920s, obviously, it was before the foundation of the Turkish Republic. But Turkish understanding, Turkish was not born in 1920s. It was born during that time, 1908, 1909, especially with the effect of young Turks, right? Those are familiar intellectual young Turks who started the Turkish nationalism. And obviously, it is very essentially important to talk about what was the situation of Turkey's position in that period? You can't jump to the 1920s and start talking about Turkey cinema at that time. So the reason I mention is that the first one was made in 1914, and since then so many films were made. And because my main focus is obviously 1980s and 1990s, so I'm trying to focus what kind of changes were made. But you're right, and thank you very much for pointing it out, that of course there were so many developments before that, let's say, when we come to 1960s or 1950s, there's a different development like Muhsin Ertuğrul. Uh, he was the sole name in the Turkish you know, cinema and he kind of monopolized and he was showing women in a very traditional way, traditional. When we come to 1970s, there's this Yeshil Cham, which, as you said, that uh, showing women in a very sexualized way, especially, you know, producing the porno films, as you said. But what is important here to look at is that what happened to the representation of women. They are all more or less the same. When we look at the scholars who are talking about Turkish cinema, whether there was a change in 1910s, 1920s, 1950s, 1970s, it was a fact that, like one of the uh, books I can suggest very strongly, Eylem Ataka's Turkish cinema, it is a milestone in this, in this area, what happened to women's depiction after 1980s? So this is the, you know, this is the turning point, let's say, in terms of representing the women. And again, the, the reasons I mentioned, the EU, women's independent movements, you know, the emergence of civil societies, and the impact of the different minority uh, organizations, then we see slightly kind of encouragement that people started to talk about and show different depictions of women. So because of our uh, limited time, obviously, I couldn't go into detail of every period's Turkish cinema, but I'd like to, I'm happy to talk about when we have more time and give you more detailed information about that. Thank you. Um, I have a, a question for you, and it's uh, mostly directed towards uh, contemporary uh, soap operas aired abroad. Uh, because my mom lost. Don't ask me about Ashko uh, No, no, no. no. <laughs> I, I don't know the title. Because I didn't <laughs> really watch that properly. I, I don't know what that means. Okay. Turkish. Oh, good enough. Oh, no, no, no. Okay. No. okay. <laughs> my mom loves Turkish soap operas, and uh, she watches them in Italy, and she watches them in Egypt. So no. I was asking, uh, what I wanted to ask it was, what about the minorities of contemporary soap operas? Especially when these soap operas are, uh, are aired oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. abroad. Uh, what I mean is, uh, in Egypt, for example, we have Harim Sultan, which mm -hmm. is like the concept mm -hmm. of the Sultan, and strictly represents the typical power relations between the Sultan mm -hmm. and the women around the Sultan. Hurem Sultan. Yeah. Are you talking about Hurem Magnificent? Magnificent? Yeah. Yeah. Right, yes. Yeah. 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 I think it just portrays the historical side of Turkey and not the actual, yes. you know, uh, the actual situation. Uh, but when we were in Italy, my mom was watching this uh, new soap opera called Happiness, and uh, you see this kind of like Disney, uh, Disney teenager dream kind of uh, theme series. And I think uh, that what's happening is that the soap opera is aired abroad in the West, in the European Union, 
and really to reshape the political and mm -hmm. um, geopolitical identity of Turkey because they're half uh, Arab and half European. Yeah. So they really, yeah. So the people around Turkey don't really know where they're standing. Mm -hmm. And uh, the difference of so far as Arab, for example, Egypt, which is a North African country, and Italy, which is a European country, is immense. And I don't think I think. The, the whole issues, uh, the whole issue of minorities and women and, patri and patriarchy is kind of fading mm -hmm. because of political issues. What do you think? Well, it's very similar, actually. Thank you again for a question to what um, yeah. Bahar asked again: is the roles of uh, women in the soap operas. One, one, one soap opera that I didn't mention just came to my mind. Well, actually, there are some soap operas who are showing these women in radical roles as well. And as you mentioned, I watched this documentary, it's a very recent film, BBC. Mm -hmm. uh, it was about the impact of Turkish soap operas on the Arab world. Yeah. It's quite interesting, that documentary, because it shows that actually not just they were showing in traditional roles, but also that Fatma Gül is the Chile. You know, what is the fault of Fatma Gül? So this, this girl was raped by, uh, you know, three or four men, and then the, the soap opera is based on her struggle against this man. How can she fight against, uh, you know, against these people who are powerful and suppressing her? And in the end, she wins the court. So this documentary, you watch that as well. Yes. So this documentary shows actually that uh, so many women in the Arab world were influenced by... Turkish soap operas, and they come out. They come out and they say that well, because of the influence of the soap operas, Turkish women, now I am going to divorce my husband. You know, so we can see that there are different changes of roles, not only in traditional <laughs> roles but also challenging this this identities as well. But just one thing, I can uh, you mentioned something very interesting. You said that we are not sure where it stands. It's a bit confusing. Well, Turkish identity is complex in itself, anyway. Turkish people cannot define themselves uh, properly anyway. Some of them say we are Western, some of them say we are Eastern, some of them say we are Mediterranean. There's always this paradoxical, you know, understanding of Turkish identity. It's still not clear for them. They are stuck between the Western and Eastern worlds, isn't it? That's one of the positions of Turkey in the world. That's the bridge between. So it's very normal to see the impact of this confusion of identity in the films and soap operas as well. Some of them present them in a very radical roles, some of them in a very traditional roles. Mm -hmm. So how you receive as an audience, it depends on your um, mm -hmm. personal experience, isn't it? <coughs> Thank you very much for that question. This is for Zaidi. I'm sorry I missed your presentation. First. But uh, can I you know. hold off? Can you hold off that question until after the um, presentation is over? Uh, after the panel is over, over coffee. Yeah. Thank you. Do you want to your question? I have a question for you. It, it is like in, in Iran, films that are there isn't much about <laughs> sort of minorities. Unfortunately, there have been some films mm -hmm. about it. Then it has led to a bit of you know, showing of my own speaking of Turkish, for example, or other minority languages within Persian language films, but hasn't gone beyond that. But yeah. about gender, there's been a lot of films, and the filmmakers are actually very public personalities. There's a lot about them, like their film uh, screenings become a sort of hub for feminists to, to raise issues and and clap for sort of characters in films, or for the filmmakers to sort of write articles, give interviews when they talk about feminist issues. So their importance goes beyond just the film circle. I was just wondering, like, you know, how much of is, that is happening in, in Turkey? So are the filmmakers only seen as, like, you know, just, just this, this is a film, and only the people who are interested in film value them? Or is there? Are there discussions around them? In the, is there any discourse? Well, uh, as I just mentioned now, of course, uh, people when they watch these films, also for us, it is a way for them to forget their own realities. Mm -hmm. Isn't there so many women as suggested that they love watching so because to forget their own real problems. And again, in the diaspora, uh, it's a new project that hopefully I will be starting very soon. Um, I started interviewing Turkish women living in Britain. 
and I was asking their opinions. How does how do these so of rests things that your emotions affect you? Or your feelings? Um, mm -hmm. and most of them say that because they are they're living in a in different country and they're you know they are missing their own cultural activities, they kind of see it as a link, as a bond between their own culture and you know the identity that, that they are associated with. Of course, these films are so for us are creating uh, some, you know, discussions, some uh, discourses for for people. Again, it, it's feeding each other. I would say feminist movement and the the ideology they're supporting by you know having an effect on the films they're produced and vice versa. So, but the unfortunate thing is that, as I mentioned, these films were produced, you know. Um, the films that belong to this new generation, I would say, new cinema moment, they are not very well known in Turkey. So in order to answer that question properly, you need to know whether these films are really shown and whether this this sort of press, mainly the films, are well received in Turkey. You know, most people are not aware of them, as I said, unless you do research. And how could it create a public debate if they don't know, for example, Journey to the Sun? Which is what one of the films that received prize abroad, and everyone almost you know who are interested in the world, or even normal public um, in abroad, they know about this kind of things, but not Turkish people, unless they have genuine interest in the cinema. So, you know, hopefully there will be an improvement in that sense, mm -hmm. especially for the funding. Or as I said, that's a major problem in, in you know Turkish cinema. Thank you. Well, I was going to ask a question that you partially answered, um, and that was about audiences. Right. Yes. So, and that's to both of you. So, are there any of these films that sort of bridge the 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 that gap between art films that are seen mostly abroad and mm -hmm. at home by elites if they're not banned, mm -hmm. and popular cinema, commercial cinema? Mm -hmm. Um, and basic, I, and I know that reception is probably outside of the uh, preserve of your research, but maybe perhaps anecdotally you can both talk a little bit about critical receptions mm -hmm. um, and audience reception. Mm -hmm. That question is to both of us? Yes. If you wish to go first. Okay, I can go first. Um, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. About um, Iranian cinema, there's a lot of sort of overlap. Sometimes many of the filmmakers, they don't know where to place them. So there is a category that the Ministry of Culture has and called film Mokhatab Khas and Mokhatab Am, meaning for special audiences or for common audiences. Uh, so they categorize them, and according to that, they give them screens to show them. So the ones that are for special audiences, they get limited uh, screenings in sort of small uh, number of cinemas. For the other ones, not. But there are filmmakers that that uh, bridge this boundary. And uh, for example, uh, Rakshan Baniyatamat, she's a, a woman filmmaker whose work is very well known outside Iran, but also in Iran. She, I don't know how, but she's managed to sort of argue her way, or maybe it is the building up to sort of becoming an, uh, an auteur. She's had her audience, so her films are shown, in, like, get a wider release and they become, you know, big box office successes. Or um, there was a separation, I think you would know it very well. This is a film about a divorce, like, in a very traumatic, sad sort of story. This was released in Iran at the time of the Persian New Year, which is the time of celebration. So I don't know if it was intentional on, on the part of the authorities. They didn't want it to uh, you know, be uh, shown in the summer. Anyway, it was shown in that period, uh, so the wide release, from what I understand, and it was a huge success. So it overshadowed a lot of things. So I think the reaction of the Audiences have become a lot more sort of uh, nuanced in their approach, so they do appreciate uh, a lot of films that, you know, so it makes it difficult for people to decide whether it belongs to one category or the other. Yes, uh, and in line with that, just uh, I'd like to give a few things. Um, in Turkey, there are a couple of films I've just remembered that 
reach to the majority of the audience in Turkey and still dealing with this kind of taboo issues. One of them is uh, Eşkia, those are familiar with Turkish cinema. That was a huge success again turning point in Turkey. And I think uh, over four or five million, if I'm not mistaken, in Turkey, you know, watched this, which was a big success. And it was about this Kurdish uh, male who was in prison for years, who's coming and trying to find his wife and find another wife having an affair with uh, another person. So, uh, the, you know, the, we see that there is indication of referring to the Kurdish identity in the film. And again, another one, Vizon Tele, it's about this uh, little Kurdish village, and they, um, the first time they are seen it on television. And it's referring to the poverty, it's referring to the, what kind of poor conditions that these people are living and there is a actually very open kind of suggestion about their identity as well. So there are some films who are, you know, creating this huge success, but again, you know, these films were easy to get funding. Uh, yes. and they were not really, you know, presenting their the films suggesting that this is what we are going to do. Probably it's like kind of under the carpet, if you know what I mean. But it's touching upon the sensitive issues reaching the audiences. Thank you very much. Thanks to all of our panelists and thank you for coming. We did so much time.